Now, I've had an opportunity today to walk around your lovely village, although I wonder why Mr. Alexander Turney Stewart felt it necessary to name it the village of Garden City. It sounds like somebody couldn't quite make up their mind what they wanted it to be. And I had a chance to w w tour what you folk call the A.T. Stewart Historical House, which was just as lovely and perplexing. I climbed up the grand stairway and into this magnificent apostle home, walked in a complete circle around the first floor to see the foyer, the office room, immense and wonderfully decorated living room, and on to the grand dining room and back to the foyer again. And then it struck me, this house has no kitchen. <laughs> this fine home must have been designed by an architect that knows my wife, Olivia. <laughs> the house has no kitchen. And when it comes to cooking, my wife likes to go shopping. I passed by the historic Garden City Hotel, which I admit is a lovely structure, but it looks amazingly too modern to be a building advertised as the exact place where Mr. Lindbergh was supposed to have slept before he flew single-handedly across the Atlantic Ocean in a plane. I had originally intended to spend some time at the Garden City Pool but discovered it was not a billiards parlor, but merely holes filled with water for little kids to spend time swimming and splashing and drinking and wetting and making a ton of noise. Uh, the noises coming from those youngsters was overwhelming, excessively loud, and as terrorizing as the screams of the cannibals I heard back in my days as a reporter in the Sandwich Islands. I could not in all honestly understand why some adult didn't take advantage of the opportunity to drown the dying little kids in the pool <laughs> and give the rest of us old timers some much needed peace and quiet. Now I'm sorry if I offended you, but I remember I've only just started. As a writer and book publisher, I certainly did not pass up the opportunity to visit your Garden City Public Library, spending a bit of time to note how many of my own works are on the shelves and how often they have been taken out for reading. <laughs> a few of my books are considered classics. The word classic means that people have a copy of the book or know someone who has a copy of the book, but they all admit they've never actually read it, <laughs> or know anybody who actually has. In fact, the definition of a classic must mean I'll get around to it someday. It's a book which people praise and figure out somebody else must have read it so they don't have to. I did happen to notice a copy of Tom Sawyer as well as a copy of The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn on a shelf. But they was dusty. <laughs> but I was pleased. Huck Finn has helped me make a tiny bit of money during my life. Some libraries have banned it, burned it publicly. The moral crusaders in town's public cane proclaimed the book to be scandalous, controversial, racist irreverent, lewd, and not fit for children. Whenever I hear that, I rush out and print up another 25,000 copies and usually sell them out in a week. I did find several copies of a newer book, Plum Island, at the library, written by a book, maybe a classic. It was written by a man named Nelson DeMille. And there were books on filling the shelves, and they were scarred and war torn and taken out frequently. Sure, I've been read by a lot of people. And I did find several copies of a popular book Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban at the library. <laughs> While this may 
book may not be considered a classic a hundred years from now. It sure do seem to have been read by a lot of folk. I decided that it's time for me to write a brand new book. But I've learned that an author can make more money when he writes a series of books of the same characters. So I'm still deciding what to name my new book. The working title is The Further Adventures of Tom Sawyer and Harry Potter <laughs> on Star Trek with James Bond. <laughs> the plot will be complex. And I will tell you, divert from my normal story now, and yes, I've been around for a long time, and most of my career was actually as a publisher and a writer. And even though I haven't been active, so to speak, <coughs> since 1910, a new Mark Twain book was just published last November. And this is the true story. The title of the book is The Prince of Oleo Margarine. And it's a children's story, illustrated. When I was young, I had three little girls and I loved them very much. We used to play together and act out some different things like that up in our house, up in Hartford. And I would tell them stories. And my little one, Susie, God bless her, she wrote an autobiography of me, and she mentioned that I used to write stories and tell them stories and mention the Prince of Oleo Margarine. And then somebody else, my daughter Clara, also had mentioned a few things in her writing, but I never got around to writing the whole thing. And everybody's gone now, but a researcher was out in California a couple of years ago looking at the Mark Twain archives file cabinet of file cabinet of all the writings and letters and manuscripts I'd put together that my youngest daughter had saved and donated. And they chronalized them. And as the guy was going through a file folder called Recipes, he found part of the story, the Prince of Oleo Margarine. It had been misfiled for 80 years. <laughs> So they hired a Caldecott award-winning couple and they made an illustrated children's book out of it. And I'm sure this library will be getting a copy of that. Interesting life and what an interesting <coughs> times we've all had when things go wrong. <laughs>